In 1816, in one of the most brutal colonies in the world, two men's lives crossed paths in the most inexplicable of circumstances and created an art explosion. Particularly the period in which Wallace was in Newcastle, which was what, 1816 to 1819 or so, was really the centre of artistic and cultural production in the colony. He arrives in Newcastle and he really sets about straightening it out, building the buildings that are necessary for a properly run military settlement. And he makes use of the skills of some of the convicts. And among those are Joseph Lysett. There's nothing like Lysett's work in southeastern Australia. It's like stepping back through time. It shows Aboriginal life as it was before 1788. And that is a rich cultural lifestyle. All of us, all Aboriginal people, I think, are proud in how we've been portrayed. I'm not just looking at these pictures like other people look at them. I look at them because I'm looking at my relatives. These are like family albums. To me, that's why Lysette is so important to Wabakal people. There's corroborees, there's hunting techniques, there's fishing, there's funerals, there's aspects of law being enacted. No one could have captured these things without an acceptance and a connection to the Aboriginal community of this region. When I'm trying to talk about pre-white settlement Newcastle and I'm trying to present that in a museum exhibition to a kid, what do I do? I put a license in. It fascinates me how so many of our stories have been preserved and given to us, gifted to us today by the most unlikely alliances between people, the Commandant and the convict. It can't be overstated that what these two men captured at that time is unique. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. We don't know what Lysa look like, and likewise of Wallace. We've got so much documentation of their movements, but we really know nothing about what these men look like, and that's quite interesting. The greatest insight into Lysa is from the artwork that he left behind. Him and his sister lost both their parents at a very young age, and were left with the care of an uncle, and had to be sort of well off, and I mean, um, he, he was given um, opportunities to undertake artistic training, but was one of those people who was living constantly beyond his means. He was probably an alcoholic. Um, he was described as having habits of intoxication which were fixed and incurable. Oh, I think he was just a con artist. I think, I think Lysett was pretty much scum of the earth. We understand that he started out as a miniatures painter in Staffordshire before he actually decided to, you know, follow the criminal line. He forged paper money in Britain because he was an engraver. He it certainly had skills as an engraver. And at that stage, if you forged paper money, which was relatively new, there wasn't a law that said that you would be executed. But if he'd stolen coin, it was an instant execution order. So he was transported to Australia. He arrived in Australia in 1814. He was given the opportunity because of his artistic background to undertake artwork of Port Jackson and the surrounds of present-day Sydney. Lysett again so you'd come to the opportunity of forgery and was caught again. He was then sent to Coal River, which is present-day Newcastle. And this place was considered for the people who couldn't be resurrected back from crime. So he was sent here. Newcastle was an appalling settlement. Stories of people wandering naked around the streets. They didn't have any clothes. He had two years in Newcastle at its roughest and most brutal, and then James Wallace arrived. Captain James Wallace had been a professional military man and served in France, came out to Australia with his company. He was responsible for perhaps the most vicious and, and horrific actions against Aboriginal people at Airds and Appen in New South Wales. And then as a sort of reward for that, Macquarie sent him to Newcastle, where he became the Commandant in 1816. Wallace was a Commandant of Newcastle 
at a time when the Macquarie's were governing New South Wales. Now the Macquarie's, Elizabeth and Lachlan, were almost, if you could see them as a power couple, they were very much charismatic people like JFK and Jackie O. And they really uh, wanted to build infrastructure. So they were looking at places like Newcastle, not like convict prisons. They saw them as fledgling towns and cities of the future. So they wanted to invest in things like building churches and schools and military academies and all sorts of things. The breakwater they began to join the mainland to Nobbies to make shipping safer because of all the coal that was going out. They were like visionaries in a way. Wallace seems to have had a program, like he had a building program, but he was also encouraging engraving, he was encouraging cabinet Tree. And he himself was an artist. I mean, not one of the world's greatest artists, it must be said. But these things wouldn't have eventuated if Wallace hadn't had the capacity and the interest and the kind of means to do it. So all credit to him, really. You see Wallace thinking, um, I'll make use of these skills. These people have wasted. You know, it's ridiculous to have a painter digging for coal. Among them is Richard Brown, who is a watercolorist and who paints portraits of Aboriginal people and plants and flowers, also um, aspects of the Aboriginal way of life. And Joseph Lyson, who for two years has been doing, you know, whatever the convicts were doing in Newcastle. And then all of a sudden, Wallace picks him up and say, you're, you know, you're an artist. You can serve my purpose by painting the progress that I've brought about here. And this was a, this kind of PR for Wallace. There is a wonderful painting in the Newcastle Art Gallery collection which shows the social life of the settlement very, very easily. There's the hunter returning from a day out hunting, the European, the free man. He's got his rifle over his shoulder. Behind him follows a convict. And then finally, there's the Aboriginal person. You're seeing that kind of offset by the outline of a church and starting of the structure of the street system down the East End. The Lysa clouds, and you definitely have that experience when a southerly buster rolls through on a summer afternoon. He's captured that. But right out in the distance across past Stockton, you're seeing plumes of smoke. So you're seeing some really interesting evidence of the traditional custodians, the Warramai nation, in that painting. So there is so much happening. Wallace was very proud of what he had achieved in Newcastle. So the church, for instance, Christchurch, it was actually not well constructed and eventually blew down a couple of years later. That Christchurch appears in many of the views of Newcastle because clearly he was proud of the fact he'd built it. Someone looking at that in the early 19th century and in a very kind of highly Christianised society would have seen that church there as a really important symbol of the success of colonisation into this heathen land as they would have seen it. The other two paintings that we have in the collection are View with Cattle in Foreground and we believe that this painting was produced topographically down towards sort of where Market Town would be right now. So that's more a view up the Hunter River. So it's quite a different vista. We have Newcastle, New South Wales looking towards Prospect Hill. Really interesting perspective on this painting because it's actually taken from the current day location of Fort Scratchley. So it's a little bit of a, a disconcerting perspective because you're not quite sure exactly what you're looking at, but you're looking at both Newcastle Beach and the harbour and the burgeoning colony at the time. So it's a really interesting painting. These works have been loaned out to across the country, to the national institution and to state institutions, as well as going to the Royal Academy in London to represent colonial painting. So extremely significant to Newcastle. And the great thing about these three paintings is that they're all very different views of Newcastle, the harbour, the beachfront and the river. And the accuracy of these works is beyond compare. I'm Charles Martin and uh, I've been doing a, an ongoing work in progress constructing old Newcastle in about the period of about the 18 20s to the 1830s. Lysart and some other contemporary artists of the time produced very accurate accounts of what Newcastle was, was like in its early built form with a couple of very accurate maps that were drawn up at about the same period of time. The challenge is to sort of build a, uh, a model and then sort of add bit by bit all the information that I could glean from the old paintings. The fourth oil painting is in the State Library of New South Wales collection. Lysett's corroboree painting is an extraordinary document. It depicts things that Europeans probably didn't see. 
also located to a very significant Aboriginal corroboree site, which is Wickham. Wickham had a real corroboree ground. And what I mean by that is that sometimes any gathering of Aborigines was seen as a corroboree. This image captures quite a number of different things. I mean, there's the tooth of Algen, which clearly shows young Aboriginal boys going through initiation process, much like you know, going on to university and getting your degrees and going through different stages. Down the front, you can see some men hitting women and dragging them away because they've crept in to see their sons being initiated. So it's very much a male only vision. And there's some men there around the fireplace. There's a couple of them with clay pipes. That's a European influence in that. Then you see in the background the flagstaff. So there's white men encroaching and starting to build. And you've got um, Wibbo Gumba and Nobbies in the background. I love the moonscape because I just think that adds to the kind of romance of it. I think in terms of the night sky and the moonlit clouds, he's, he's taking that directly from an artist he would have known, Joseph Wright of Derby, who was a northerner English artist, very famous for that kind of signature moonscape. It's a large painting, it's in oil. It's not the work of a genius painter, but it's for Lysett, he's actually really thought about the way he's going to compose that work. Is that a whole week all captured in once? Or is it just one night and that's actually how it was. It is a very, very significant one in a cultural context. It captures what many other places don't have. If this is not the most powerful, detailed, intricate capture of a gathering ever of our people here, I don't know what is. The time of Wallace's period as Commandant in Newcastle was a bit of an art explosion. I think the interesting thing is that Wallace captured Newcastle in so many ways through his artists, like Brown and Lysett and a bit later Close. As a result, we've got some really incredible documentation of Newcastle and one of the most unusual is the Macquarie Chest. Wallace had two collector's chests made and these were probably made by Webster, who was one of the convicts that Wallace was using, and decorated by Lysett. It is one of the most powerful and emotive things the library has. You never get sick of showing it to people. They were basing it on this idea of the campaign furniture, which officers had for ferrying around their goods and chattels, and it was always designed so that it would pack neatly in the hold of a ship. You can take off the legs, the handles, are all flush. They're collector's chests for people to fill full of trophies and natural history specimens. It was like a little mini museum. I think he was just amazed by what he was seeing. The intersects, for instance, he arranged into patterns, not by taxonomy, but just by colour and size and shape. There lots of birds there, for instance. Very expertly preserved. The art of preserving specimens was fairly new. But whoever was doing it for Wallace was cutting edge. You know, you'd have to think that Aboriginal people would have been contributing to the collection of those specimens. The colours are just fresh as the day they were shot, really. Lysett's paintings depict kangaroos, swans. You know, no one had seen black swans before in England. And then wonderful picture of fish on the top of one of the panels. A sort of modelled on hunting and gaming and fishing paintings, which we'd see in any manor house in provincial England. The whole thing is just an extraordinary confusion of ideas and excitements and it's, it's a wonderful scene. What a beauty. It's a stunning piece of art, museological fascination, the Wunderkammer. It's sad and beautiful at the same time and you can understand that there's also an agenda behind it. Wallace has obviously wanted to show the artistic riches and the skills of his convicts that he's been able to encourage in Newcastle. We have shown it to so many people and no one can point to anything like it in any other institution in the world. I mean, it just seems to be unique. It's just the most bizarre thing. Later on in 1820, when he's retired and living at Parramatta, Lysett then depicts a range of activities of Aboriginal people in Newcastle, a spectacular series of watercolours. And what Lysus' artwork so clearly captures is that this place was a virtual paradise of plenty. Many people that come into this region spoke of the incredible health and vitality 
and fitness of Aboriginal men and women of this region. We are proud of what he captured and they were unique. They weren't just stereotyped paintings, which he did. Lysett's uh, paintings show um, traditional practices occurring. In the background, you've got the burnings and even the details with the types of spears that they were holding. Where they spear and eels, they're using the fishing spears. And so they've got three or four prongs on them, totally different to the, a war spear or, or a hunting spear. One of the images of Lysett so brilliantly captures is Aboriginal um, men climbing trees, I mean, certainly in pursuit of possums and birds and eggs, and using their axes to cut marks for their feet and their hands to climb the trees. And Aboriginal people were extremely proficient in climbing these trees very, very quickly, procuring the game that they were after and um, hurling it to the bottom. There was someone else down there to quickly capture it, and it wouldn't be too long before it was on the fire, and you can't beat that for freshness. Lysett's paintings give us a very good idea of the topography of Newcastle before, of course, a great deal of European settlement. So you come up on the mountain, you can look out over all of our traditional country. There's lots and lots of sites up here, lots of activity that took place up here over thousands and thousands of years. And Lysett painted the view of Sugarloaf from the Spears Point region, looking across to here. I think Lysett would have known it's important. Another wonderful aspect of Lysett's capacity to capture Aboriginal hunting techniques, and this is on the Cocon, the Hunter River, wetlands of that particular region was again another incredible resource for food. I mean, the incredible bird life. They're actually swans. Our people ate swans. My father, my grandmother, they lived on them. If you look closely at the picture, one bird is being speared, but the others have sticks that have got hooks on them, and they're putting it over the birds and capturing the birds alive. If you've got something alive, it doesn't deteriorate. The ones that they're spearing, they're probably going to have something to eat when they're finished, but the others they're capturing so they can move on to somewhere else and then eat them later on. So it's keeping your meat fresh to where you want to get it to. As Lysett uh, painted more, um, there is change. There is actual change in the people, how he painted them. One of the things you can see is, is that like in that one we were just talking about with the, around the wetlands there, the people were natural. Wearing clothes was an unnatural thing. At some particular point, he then started to paint these things which today we call lap laps. I'm not aware of them being painted prior to him. Did he come up with this idea which we then, whatever decades later, seen that and us today wanting to still dance. Oh, that's what we did then. Well, it's not what we did then because we can tell by the paintings before. It was Lysett instrumental that every single Aboriginal man who today gets up and puts a red or a white or a black lap lap on is actually honouring Lysett? I don't know. Like, it's, that's a weird, freaky thing to say, but we never did it. We never wore cloths like that. If we were to be wearing something, they would be made of natural materials. Possum or roo or whatever other animal we, you know, we use every single piece. That's what they would have been made of. Not materials. One of the most significant uh, artworks by Joseph Lysett is the whale feast. This was a thing that is known in the area that when a whale was beached, messages went out to all the different clans within uh, proximity of, of Newcastle who would all come in to join in and, and be a part of the, this major feast. I'd align this particular image with Bar Beach and a very well-known landmark in Newcastle. The men did all the cooking. Lysett has also captured that with the men overseeing the, uh, the cooking of the whale. It's not that our people hunted them, we never did that. We had a relationship with them. Yes, it had passed away, so an opportunity was taken to share because that would what it would want as well because it has a relationship with our people, whales, uh, and more specifically the humpback. It's in our creation stories. You know, spiritually, it's our creator. Yeah, another one that captures the, the rich marine cultural lifestyle and feasting that Aboriginal and proficient fishermen and women that Aboriginal people were. This particular image, I feel, was Merriweather. It's the site where we now have the ocean baths 
and a lot of these rocks would have been broken up. You can see where it is at Meriwether today, you can go out onto the, the rocks uh, to the left of the, of the ocean bars. When you look at the landscape of Meriwether and where the houses are at the top of that bluff, it really does sit really well. And you've got Aboriginal people coming out of the water with lobsters. You've got giant snapper being caught. Again, the fires are burning. There's people on the top of the bluff, probably on the lookout for fish, whale, um, whatever. And you can see the water that's coming down from the top, which that still happens at Meriwether at the back of the club there. So that must have been a fresh water supply of water coming down from the top. The accuracy of the paintings as far as cultural practices, they're hunt and ruse. They've set fire to the bush and that is a hunting practice. And you see them with boomerang or tarama is what we call it, with spears and they're up on the side of the hill and right around. They've set fire and the ruse are coming out and that way they can get them easy. Also, they use the fire to help germinate seed, clear the area, even the picture that's looking back at Sugarloaf. That whole area, was just, it's like it's, they've had the mower on there. They'd open that up so the ruse had come out. They'd get out onto that really good grass in the pasture. And that's the proper management by our people of the landscape. They're managing their stock like they try and do today with sheep and cattle and that. And they're bringing them to areas where they can hunt them easy. There's a lot of these pictures like manicured lawns. And I don't think he's just doing it for the sake of doing it, because other places he draws lots of trees. And I think if it was really thick bush, he'd show that. Because again, he was someone who went on accuracy. The event which he captured there, I don't even know if that's ever been captured by anyone else. What were all these other people coming here to do? Yeah, when they will want to capture the lifestyle. And that's where you can see the difference in Lysett's work compared to everyone else's work. He did stuff at a time when things were raw as well. And our people, wherever they are in this country, living with and caring for this place. And that is just so damn unique. Lysett's capacity to capture night images and the images here of Lake Macquarie night and Aboriginal canoes out on the lake with their torches fishing and then the banquet being served up on the main fires back on the shore, the fish being brought in. When I look at that painting, there's knowledge in it. You got a full moon up. When's also the best time to go fishing? Full moon. He got the accuracy of also the timing of when uh, the people were then out. Calm night. I go fishing with my mates and it's like we're doing the exact same thing. These canoes all had clay ovens as part of that. So fish could be brought out of the water and even crabs. I mean, you know what spotlighting is like. I mean, they've got torches out there. You know that crabs will be coming to the surface. It's funny because of the night time when you've got a big spotlight, the fish will even jump into the boat. The people are extremely happy sitting around the fires on the shore. A great quantity of seafood straight for the fire. The Newcastle scene, which is one of Lysett's most famous, it depicts the rich cultural lifestyle, the closeness of the Aboriginal families and community units sitting by the fire in their gunyas, you know, in close proximity to what is now Newcastle Harbour, which was all beachfront at that particular point in time, looking out to Wibbogumba, which is what is present day nobbies. The dingoes, I mean, lying by the fire and lying next to their, their owners. Everyone's happy in this image, even the dogs are smiling. <laughs> you could go back eons and Aboriginal people for thousands of years in this same setting. But for one small impediment to the right, what is now Fort Scratchley, the start of British settlement there, I mean, you can see up on the very top. But it's also sad because it was not long after their place was taken away from it. And that wasn't allowed to happen anymore. The introductions of the bad stuff come not long after. And is, is that a representation of maybe one of the last happy times of the people from here? All licensed images were not just of Newcastle. I mean, he did work in, in Sydney and Tasmania, and Port Macquarie, Port Stephens. 
He had frequent trips to Sydney for Wallace, who Wallace would send him to Sydney to study some of the architecture down there, capture it in artwork, then bring it back to Newcastle for Wallace's ideas of buildings that could be put up. He was on board a ship that had to go first to Port Stephens before it went back to Sydney. And a whole mob of Warramai people on the shore who hurled their spears at the, the, the longboat that had come off the, the ship. And Lysett was one of the ones that was wounded uh, from that and took some time to recover, but he was okay. He wasn't in the same domain as he was back in Newcastle where clearly he knew people and had a relationship with them, where here he did not. And he'd not stepped, taken the right protocols to step through to build up trust and respect and, and establish a relationship and he copped a spear instead. <laughs> the image of what I depict as Aboriginal sporting games, we were a culture like the Spartans of Greece. There's a misconception that Aboriginal people were warlike, we were warriors. If we were warriors we'd be stealing each other's land, there was no concept of that in Australia. The image of this is, is a, it's like a sporting games. He's captured the crowd sitting in the bleachers, if you like, watching the sporting event unfold. And here Aboriginal people are practicing uh, spear throwing and there's fights between individuals. But the spears are not being thrown at an individual. There you can clearly see the gaps. What Lysett's captured here, they've been thrown into a gap. And I mean, this is the point to be made here. This was a, a really about sport and fitness and to be really proficient and precise with what you were throwing at. One of the critical things that Lysett has captured is, is the Aboriginal legal system, if you like. If a person broke the law, they would have to appear before court and they would be given a shield to protect themselves and the prosecutors would be armed with spears. You've also got the jury in this image sitting off to the side. So whatever the crime that had been committed, this individual had to face the consequences. And several of the, the prosecutors would come up and hurl spears, which he had to dodge or fend off with his shield. I mean, whatever the outcome was, either he was guilty and he's dead, or he wasn't and he's okay because he survived the court case. Lies at capturing an Aboriginal funeral, it's the significance and um, the sense of loss and spiritual connection of what is happening and significance of an event like a funeral that Aboriginal people placed on such events and Lysett really does capture that. It is clearly a Sydney painting but interestingly enough most of the body artwork seems to have come from Newcastle and of their artwork and the significance to the individual who's passed on. And you can see the people there with the branches and singing is going on. It's captured beautifully. I've grown up with the stories and us going out in the bush and, and learning those things. And I can look at those pictures and go, yep, but what I've learnt, I can see in these pictures. So for me, it's a beautiful period and it's incredible that it was recorded in painting because we didn't have cameras at the time. So the best that you can have is a, is a skillful artist. And that's the importance of having a forger like uh, Lysett. The detail that you would need to forge a banknote, um, if you can apply that same detail to recording Aboriginal life, you know that you trust the detail in the paintings themselves. Well, you can't tell the story of Wallace without telling the story of Burrigan. Wallace seems to see Newcastle as almost like this halcyon period of his life, and he does reflect back about the beautiful time he had at Newcastle. He's ambitious for the colony, it suits his interests, he can build, he obviously pursues artistic interests, and he also forms strong relationships, or one particular relationship, with an Aboriginal man, Burrigan. When Macquarie came to visit on three occasions, on the second occasion, he was in raptures because he just loved everything that was going on and this was all interwoven with Burrigan. Burrigan was the leader of the Awabakal people. He was one of those Aboriginal people who interacted with the Europeans and he seems to have had the respect of the Aboriginal people and had the Aboriginal people show the Europeans more of their life than perhaps uh, would normally be the case. Burrigan's an ex inspiration to our people, you know. Um, he, he was seen as a kind and gentle man. A corroboree is organised for Macquarie's visit to Newcastle. Uh, and Burrigan is sitting in the forefront of that 
almost with his face to the camera, so to speak, smiling, that's Burrigan. The oil painting view of Newcastle, and the three little figures in that painting, you, you see the, the lead figure I think is probably Wallace, then his sergeant of whom he was also very fond, and an Aboriginal figure brings up the trio with a dog. Wallace talks about hunting with Burrigan, going out into the bush, and he trusted Burrigan more than he trusted Europeans. And, and to me, it seems that probably Lysett has actually put this little vignette of that trusty trio of friends that uh, Wallace held. And it's got a, you know, in a way that is quite a sweet moment, I think, of, of colonial art and friendship. Wallace writes a really telling account of, of Burrigan. There are scenes in all our lives to which we turn back with pleasure though perhaps with a tinge of melancholy feelings. And now I remember poor Jack, that's Burrigan, the black savage ministering to my pleasures, fishing, kangaroo hunting, guiding me through trackless forests with more kindly feelings than I do many of my own colour, kindred and nation. And that seems to be another side to the personality. So we know the Appen Massacre Wallace, and then there's this Burrigan Wallace and how you kind of mesh those two together, I really don't know. I think Burrigan being such a kind and gentle man may have actually rubbed off on the white bloke. The, the people that they called savages had an influence on the people that we called savages because the white people were the savages to our people. Burrigan um, was murdered by a white convict, one of two that were escaping. Those convicts were tried for that murder. They were convicted, tried and were hung. It's the first time that a European was ever uh, arrested, tried and convicted for the murder of an Aboriginal in Australia. Because of this relationship that he had with the, with the Commandant and the respect that they had with the authorities. Eventually, Lysa get sent back from Newcastle to Sydney to work with Macquarie. And it was only when Macquarie was leaving Australia that he was finally pardoned. And then he seemed to come into money in 1822, and he was able to afford passage back to England in 1823 for himself and two children. Went back to England and, and went into the production of producing his book. Which is Views in Australia, which are engravings uh, of New South Wales and Tasmania. The Tasmanian illustrations are a real problem because we know that Lysett never went to Tasmania. Art historians are still fighting about that one. It's the last great pictorial record of the colony. Why it was produced remains a problem, but it's really a prospectus. It's, a, it's to convince people to invest in Australia, to buy land in Australia. Which wasn't a success that he'd hoped for. And he finished up, of course, back forging again <laughs> and caught in Birmingham in, 18, in 1828. He, uh, he, commi well, he, he was caught and he committed suicide. He cut his throat unsuccessfully. He died a few months later in February 1828 in the Birmingham Infirmary. He was just a hopeless forger. <laughs> So we know that the paintings left with Wallace, when he left Newcastle, he had actually been commissioned to India, to Kolkata. How they survived in that humidity, I don't know, but they eventually ended up back in the UK. And then, of course, retires, and in England writes a really delightful account of his time in Australia, which has got illustrations by Lysett. Wallace was an amateur artist, but we also understand that he did take credit for uh, works of art that he did not produce. Interestingly, on the back of Interview of Newcastle, there's an assemblage of labels on the back in beautiful handwritten script. It says Commandant Wallace as the uh, artist, which is a bit cheeky, but uh, yeah, we definitely know that's Eliza. The people who owned the convict could set them about a task. But that was just the tradition of, you know, the person in charge. They're a long way from Australia. Why not claim it as yours? Mm. Wallace had a personal copy of his book, which he gave to his wife, which later disappeared for about 150 years, turning up in Canada. You know, I think this Wallace album is just the most magic thing and seemed to emerge from the ether. No one knew of it, no one had never been heard of, no one had ever seen it before. He obviously had a copy of this book that he'd published, his um, historical account of the colony of New South Wales, and he starts to put into it 
memories, if you like, like a kind of scrapbooking his career. When we acquired it, the auctioneer was just doing a deceased estate. He opened up a cupboard and pulled out this album and didn't know what it was. And there was this major piece of Australiana just sitting in Canada. One of the reasons it is important is because actually not much material from that period survives. Includes watercolours perhaps by Lyset and some botanical drawings also by Lyset. These extraordinary portraits of Aboriginal people, which Wallace himself I think has made, we paid $2 million for it, so it was a very significant purchase. It's priceless. It's a piece of Newcastle history, which again is, I would say, is the envy of other places around the country. After we acquired it and we went up to Newcastle, you know, for those communities, those Aboriginal communities up there, it was like you know, their ancestors coming back. That's what it's all about, it's this physical connection. And I can watch them live their daily life through these pictures. I mean, there are images of Burrigan in that book as well that we've never seen, taken at different times of his life. And then the last part where you get Wallace's remembrance of life in Australia and his relationship with Burrigan, that's, that's really quite touching. That's, that's, a, that's a different thing. It's just this amazing kind of reflection on the 19th century early colonial experience and it's all in one album and it's you know it's just been one of the most exciting things I've been involved in the purchase of. We can see Newcastle in very early European times but also predating our arrival here because of the work of both of those men. They're here doing it at that critical time when the worlds were almost kind of balanced between the European invading and the Aboriginal world that was still sort of intact but holding on, you know, desperately to its traditions and its culture. Joseph Lysa gives us a sense of pride. He painted things that other people would never have seen and weren't allowed to see. So he had this key to a door that he could unlock and go through where other people, the door shut in their face. So he could only have that because he's been given that by our people. They weren't just stereotyped paintings which he did. This rich collection of works that he's left that offers this snapshot into Aboriginal cultural life prior to British arrival. Magnificent. Lysett wasn't a da Vinci or a Van Gogh but he was pretty damn good at what he did. Now kids need to know those stories of, of who was here before us because they're still here.